Abraham Lincoln said he was not concerned about having God on his side. He wanted to make sure he was on God's side. And in politics, there's multiple sides. There's the Democrat blue side and Republican red. This conversation, though, is going to be with the blue side, the Democrat perspective, as we're going to talk with Congressman John Yarman, who has been representing the 3rd District of Kentucky, and he is a Democrat. Guys, once again, we have another episode of Decades, this time the Democrat perception on recent U.S. history. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You Another plane has just hit. It hit another building. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. guys welcome back uh, our next guest is chairman john yarman who represents the third district for kentucky in the u.s house of representatives uh, currently he is in his seventh term he was elected chairman of the house's budget committee for the 116th congress he has been recognized for his work in improving education expanding access to affordable health care and revitalizing manufacturing here in Louisville. Uh, Chairman Yarmouth, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's good to be with you and good to be with all you guys. Uh, I've had some wonderful times at Trinity uh, speaking to the different groups and I uh, look forward to this. Well, I appreciate you returning because uh, you came to our class in 2017. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the revisit sure. Although in a new format for us. right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you've represented the Commonwealth's third district. Uh, working with the Bush administrations, the Obama administration, and the Trump administration. As you look back uh, along your legislative career, uh, representing the city of Louisville in the third district, what is the legislation that you're most proud of, uh, that you were in the yeas? Well, uh, without question, it would be the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I was, um, at that time, on the Ways and Means Committee, which was one of the committees that drafted part of the the legislation. So I had a role in, in actually developing the plan and then to vote for uh, really the most significant expansion of health care since, uh, uh, since Medicare in 1964. That was a, a, a great moment. And I, I remember the night that we, um, we passed that in late March of 2010, I was walking off the floor with a guy named David Obi who was then chairman of the Appropriations Committee and uh, had been in Congress for 40 years. And he said, you know, John, I don't know why I'd ever want to come back after this because nothing I could ever do will be as important as what we just did. And uh, a few months later, he announced his retirement. Uh, but, you know, I, I think most of us who were there at the time felt the same way, that that, that would be the most significant thing that we had uh, ever been able to accomplish. Um, and what, why, I mean, just because of the access that it was going to be for the entire nation, the ease of it? Well, I mean, to, to correct a, a serious deficiency in society, when you, we had at the time 40 million uh, uninsured um, Americans, and uh, with so many problems with uh, people who had pre existing conditions not being able to get insurance, with uh, people who were who got out of uh, college and as soon as they got out of college they 
had to get their own insurance. And uh, so they couldn't, it was a problem to go to grad school or to take a year off or do an internship. So uh, there were just so many problems with the healthcare system and there still are, but we corrected uh, so many of them that we made um, we made healthcare more accessible, but we also made it less stressful. And before we passed the ACA, there were 800,000 bankruptcies every year uh, because of healthcare costs. And uh, you know, we, we resolved a lot of that. There's still too many of those, but again, we reduced the number. So you know, I think at the time, th those who opposed the, the ACA said, well, it's, it's, this is the road to uh, universal healthcare. And my response was, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> we, need, we need universal health care. Uh, we're the only industrialized nation in the world that doesn't have it. So uh, it was a, a huge step forward. And uh, it, again, I, I can't see unless we, uh, while I'm still here, or do pass Medicare for, for everyone or something like that. I don't think that's likely. But um, uh, I think that'll be the most significant thing by, by a long shot. There have been some other things. Uh, one of the things I was very proud of was just this past year, we were able to fix a problem that had existed for 40 years that where widows of, um, of fallen soldiers, uh, widows or uh, uh, spouses whose, whose spouse mm -hmm. were killed in action were actually penalized because of a, an offset in benefits. So there were two kinds of survivors benefits. If you got one, you got one automatically, the other you paid premiums for, but if, if your spouse died, one was credited against the other. So even though you had been paying for it, uh, you lost it. And it was about a $15,000 a year um, uh, penalty oh, wow. for those spouses who lost their, uh, their spouse in, in uh, battle. And what it had always been a problem because people always thought we couldn't afford to do it. And finally, um, I was working with Joe Wilson. I introduced the bill in the House, um, and we got it uh, actually included in a big defense bill and got it passed. So it was about 64,000 Americans um, who's, who had lost someone to, to, uh, in their service, and we were able to solve that problem for them after, again, after 40 years. So I was really proud of that as well. Well, very good. Now, the Affordable Care Act will be definitely going into history books, and um, its chapter is still being written, uh, at least speculated that it's still being written. Um, but with your career in legislation, you've seen some pretty historical events being at, at Washington, from the 2008 recession, the election of President Obama being the first black man uh, right. elected. Um, the wars in Iraq coming to an end, but we're still in war in Afghanistan, uh, the killing of Osama bin Laden, uh, COVID-19, our summer, uh, this past summer with the protest after the George Floyd killings, and then of course the election of 2020. Um, from a historical perspective, being in Washington, D.C., uh, what one of those events, or is there another event that you think is going to probably have a longer lasting, uh, resonating impact in the books that we'll still be studying 20, 50, 100 years from now? <laughs> well, I'm afraid it's going to be the damage that the Trump administration has done to uh, the functioning of government, the operations of government, and, and the trust of the, the American people in government. Uh, I hope that's not the case. and. Uh, Joe Biden has a, a great opportunity to, to correct some of that. But um, unless you're here and you, you're, you see what he has done to the Justice Department, the CIA, the, uh, the FBI, which is in the Justice Department, um, the Consumer F uh, Financial Protection Bureau, agencies, even the Treasury Department, where he's hollowed out those agencies and their State Department's another example, uh, give you, you in the State Department, there are nine undersecretaries, and these are the people who actually know, they have expertise in a certain area, like there's an undersecretary for the Middle East. Uh, seven of those nine positions are vacant. So, so what he's done is he has, he has eliminated so many talented people in the actual operation of government, and that's gonna take a while to correct. But in terms of, you know, 
the, the Obama administration, certainly electing the first black president was incredible, but now we have uh, the first uh, black uh, female vice president, uh, right. I, I would argue equally historic. You know, I, I served with the first female speaker uh, of the House of Representatives, uh, and <clears throat> she has certainly left uh, a mark on that position and, and the country. Um, and, but, um, and yet we, one thing you forgot to mention was the, the, uh, the financial collapse in 2008, which uh, did incredible yeah. damage to the economy for almost 10 years. Yeah. And uh, now we have COVID, so, which is gonna do damage to the economy uh, uh, for a period of time as well. So there are a lot of historic uh, 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 happenings that, um, you know, I think we'll be studying and, and talking about a lot of them for a long time. Um, you mentioned uh, President Trump and President-elect Biden. Um, I want to take you back to when you first uh, campaigned. You were going against Representative Ann Northup. Uh, and she claimed foul because you gave yourself, uh, the, your campaign, a $400,000 loan. You pointed out in the campaign she was taking money from big business from Halliburton. Um, but when we look at from that point uh, to where we are now, just this uh, summer of this election cycle, we had records all across the nation. Um, in our own Commonwealth, we saw uh, Amy McGrath and Senator Tom McConnell spend nearly $120 million uh, on their campaigns, raising over 140. Our president uh, election, we saw a combined $1.4 billion on it. Um, and that's, that's a very short distance between what you were going through and what we were now. With this rapid increase in campaign financing that we're seeing and spending, is this something that is truly benefiting the American public or is it a consequence? Oh, it's not benefiting the American public at all. Uh, you know, if, if um, if campaigns were held to strict standards of honesty and accuracy uh, in their advertising, then that might benefit the American people. But of course they're not. Um, we, in my, in my first campaign, uh, then Representative North of, uh, ran an ad which had six or seven things that she said I did which, uh, which really weren't accurate. Um, and we actually came back with an ad that was very humorous. We had me on a, in a, a, next, a picture of me next to Saddam Hussein. And the, the narrator said, John Yarmouth plays golf with Saddam Hussein and snatches toys away from little children. Ridiculous, no more so than Ann Northup's dishonest uh, ads. The fact is, after 10 years in office, Ann Northup can't talk about her own record, so she makes up things about John's. So, and we kind of inoculated me against uh, further attacks, but um, that, that was mild what she did compared to some of the things you see today. And um, the, the, the reality is, um, and I argue with um, our people all, uh, all the time, it's wasted money. Yeah. It's wasted money. So few people, voters, are actually persuadable these days. Uh, one estimates about that it's about 10, at most 10 to 15%. The other 85 to 90 percent have already made up their mind in any given race, and because of partisan loyalties mostly. So, uh, and very few people are watching live TV anymore. It's it's well over 50 percent who don't watch live TV. They're they're either streaming stuff or they're watching Netflix or um, Amazon Prime or Hulu or whatever it may be. And so you're you're spending all this money to reach a very few potential uh, persuadable voters. And what many of us are arguing is the real, the only effective way to reach people today is, is in the digital universe. It's not on, on television. And yet we raise millions of millions of dollars, billions, as you said, and, uh, and spend it on TV, which people don't watch. And of the people who actually watch it, most of them hate it. <laughs> hate them and they don't believe them. So, you know, it's a, other than that, it's a great strategy. But uh, I, I think we really, you know, I've been um, 
an opponent of this unlimited fundraising for a long time. I introduced a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, which was the decision that opened the floodgates okay. uh, of money. And uh, of course, that's, that hasn't gone anywhere. But I, I think the, the American people if, who know what Citizens United decision was, and you ask them if they approve of it, 90 something percent say no, they didn't approve of it, and we ought to get money out of politics. So we know where the public is on this. And uh, with, with the huge amount of money that goes to, um, that comes from a special interests, uh, that certainly influences the actions we take up here. There's no question about that. And I, I'm, uh, you know, I've taken some as well. I mean, you can't unilaterally disarm in this, in this world, right. but, um, but it, it needs to change. And, and again, the American people want it to change. Uh, imagine if we could have used, you know, just a portion of that for our schools and our communities and things of that, right. you know, where people were contributing to a school versus uh, a campaign that more yeah. likely is going to show a dishonest ad. Yeah, you don't, uh, you don't, you, you don't want to keep, uh, you don't want to prohibit anybody from giving money to campaigns because that's the only way some people can participate. But correct. you can put reasonable limits on it so that uh, the average American's voice whether it's twenty-five or fifty dollars that they may give, uh, isn't uh, overwhelmed by five thousand dollar contributions or or even more. Um, you, you shared uh, working with the speaker uh, just a few moments ago and the impact that the speaker has. Um, I got I started becoming in love with politics when I was nine years old. My, my father took me to the nineteen eighty uh, election booth with him, um, and I was just ecstatic about it. Um, and since then, I watched, you know, uh, I watched President Reagan, who's considered the great communicator, create sort of bipartisan, he's known for creating a bipartisan government. And uh, during his term, uh, two terms, we had on average almost 700, for Congress, 700 laws enacted. And in that entire eight years, there was uh, only 14 legislative failures. Um, you're working in a very different Congress now. And in the last 10 years, uh, Congress is averaging uh, well, almost 60% less with uh, just over 300 laws enacted. And in the legislative failures in 10 years has gone to an astounding 118 legislative failures. Is Congress so polarized that it's not really working or is there still bipartisanship there? There's very little bipartisanship, and there, there are a variety of reasons for it. And by the way, of those 300 whatever bills that we passed, I guarantee you no more than 10 of them were of, of any consequence. The vast majority are non-controversial bills. They could be resolutions expressing support for a certain cause. They may be naming a post office or a federal building for someone. Uh, and these are, you know, they, we call them suspension bills uh, because you suspend the rules and you pass them have to have two thirds uh, majority, but they all get past 400 to two or something like that. Uh, right. the, 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 the consequential legislation is, is basically, it's only, it's only, it's been limited primarily to funding measures where mandatory of things where we have to fund the government, uh, okay. those types of, of things. So partisanship, part of it is that, and, you know, the Senate has a 60 vote rule. Uh, neither party has had 60 members since uh, 2009. Okay. And um, it's almost impossible with the partisan uh, pressures to, to get 60 votes in the Senate. So we, and then you have uh, Mitch McConnell sitting as majority leader. He decides what comes to the floor. Right we've passed over 400 bills that are sitting on his desk that he's not even considered for action. And many of them came out of the house with bipartisan majorities. Uh, so you, sometimes you have an individual who just wants to run uh, the body the way he or she wants to run it. And that prevents us from doing things. When, when, we, were in the major, when, we, when we were in the minority with Barack Obama, um, what happened was the Republicans introduced only bills that, that were so extreme that we call them messaging bills. So they voted 60 something times uh, in the House to repeal the Affordable Care Act. 
because they knew they were never going to get passed, get enacted and, and signed into law by the president. So they would just pass bills to, to basically uh, uh, eliminate the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act. Again, never intending for, their, for them to pass. So we all voted against them, they all voted for them, and they went nowhere. Uh, but a lot of that is done for fundraising. So again, m the money in politics affects the system in different ways. So people would introduce bills that they knew their, their donors would like, okay. uh, even though they knew they would never pass. So there, there are all sorts of factors involved in this, but the, the truth is that we, we have become extremely polarized as a, as a country, they're very tribal, and it's manifested itself in, in a lot of ways. And one of those is the, the very, the difficulty in getting any significant uh, legislation passed in the Congress. I mean, you just said we are polarized as a nation. And one of the exciting things that political scientists and historians are gonna have in looking at this 2020 election is, is this sharp divide. I mean, um, as exciting as it is, we had 144 million Americans come vote, which was a record. Uh, a voter turnout that we have not seen since 1900, 1904. I mean, this, these, these are great signs for the American people, but when we look at these numbers, um, we see a very stark divide. Uh, like Kentucky, for example, um, blue only went in two counties, Jefferson and Fayette are urban. The, red, the other 118 counties were all red. But Kentucky is not an anomaly. Uh, if you look in Georgia, Pennsylvania, and things like that, the urban cities are, are blue uh, and the rural counties are red. And that's not saying everybody who lives in the city is blue and everybody right. in the county is red, but that's just, that's the pattern. Is, is this a polarization problem that we are not going to be able to fix? Um, not in the near future. We, okay. won't, we won't be able to fix it. I mean, I think eventually we, we will. You know, we talk about the race problem in America, <clears throat> and there certainly is one. There's a lot of systemic race, racism, and there's a lot of uh, societal racism. But eventually, you know, everybody's going to be biracial, biracial several, several generations from now. So we'll breed our way out of that uh, I think the, the racism problem, and that'll eliminate one of the polarizing factors in, in society. The urban-rural divide is real, it's, um, um, but it's mostly cultural. And we as, we as Democrats, and I just actually wrote a piece uh, for Leo Weekly this week, uh, appears today, I think, online, uh, about one of, the, one of the things that Democrats are really bad at, and we're bad at showing respect. And the, the vast majority of voters don't vote based on issues. You know, I, I say they're 15 to 20 percent on the left and 15 to 20 percent on the right who vote because of an issue or more or issues. They're they're not persuadable. They're not winnable. They're already set in their in their thinking in their ways. The rest of the country votes on not with their head but with their gut and with their heart. And the, the one thing that you have to do in order to win somebody's heart or gut is get them to trust you. And if you don't show them respect, they're not gonna trust you. Yeah. Uh, this is why Joe Biden was successful. He understands that. Actually, Trump understood it, understands it. Yeah. He, he does, it's not genuine with him. It's very, um, it's very disingenuous, but he understands that. And that's why, you know, he goes to these rallies, he shows them respect by showing up. And uh, that's, that's the, you know, I tell everybody, the biggest key to politics is you gotta be, you gotta be empathetic and you have to be genuine. And that's, people get that, they, they again, they feel it viscerally. And we, we're not, because we think, even though Democrats, I, I believe, have a lot more empathy than Republicans, uh, we think that if we put out a 10 page position paper that shows how that is how we're going to help millions of Americans, that that will win their support. But it's not because they don't necessarily believe that we, we trust them and respect them. And, you know, yeah, I remember during the Obama administration, he made that famous comment about, you know, the rural America has their Bible and their guns 
and so forth. And that's, again, that's disrespectful. And we've got to get away from that and show that those people in, in rural communities that we do respect them, that we understand the challenges they face, and we want to we want to compete for their support. And we we've we've got to have we've got to do that as a party, top to bottom. Yeah, I, and it is. Uh, I mean, it is such an interesting when you look at each state's county county's uh, way that they went. It, it is a very powerful uh, yeah. image to look at. Now you shared uh, gaining support and things. Um, Something I've been teaching since uh, 1997. And when I first started teaching, we were doing fire drills, earthquake drills, and tornado drills. Um, but in the last decade, we've added a new drill, and that is the armed intruder drill. Um, between 2009 and 2018, there were over 180 school shootings in, in this nation. Um, Kentucky experienced it with Marshall County High School on January 23rd, 2018, when two students were killed and 14 were wounded and men the nation was really even put to their knees when we looked at uh, Majory Stoneman Douglas High School just a few weeks later, yeah. and 17 were killed. Um, every time there's a, a school shooting, we can always go to Twitter and we can see our elected officials saying, you're in our thoughts, you're in our prayers. But thoughts and prayers don't protect students. They don't protect schools. Um, you surely Congress has seen this as well. So what has Congress done in these last years to, besides just offering us thoughts and prayers, what, are, what has Congress done to protect us? And, and what is on the agenda for Congress, if there is anything on the agenda for Congress in this situation? Well, we've done virtually, we've done virtually nothing. Uh, okay. this, this F that I wear on my lapel every day and have for the last couple of years, that's my, my rating by, from the NRA. Uh, they give me an F and I'm proud of it uh, because you know, I'm constantly trying to, to push for sensible gun um, safety legislation. We, we passed in the house uh, universal background checks, We've done that on, on a couple of occasions, it goes nowhere in the Senate. That's a proposition that 90% of the American people are for, 75% of NRA, National Rifle Association members are for that. Uh, and yet it, we can't get it through the Senate. The one thing we've been able to do is we finally got uh, legislation to allow the, the Center for Disease Control to actually study gun violence and we gave them some money to do that. Um, right. that's, a, that's, a, that's a significant, I mean, that's, and that's important, but it's not anywhere near uh, what we need to do. Um, so it, it's, it's a shame. The NRA is a failing organization. They're losing clout, they're losing money, but uh, they still have a great deal of influence, uh, particularly on rural states senators. And there are more rural state senators because the two senator for each state rule right. yeah, from the Constitution that um, that they're able to to keep anything from happening there. And it's uh, it's a shame, but you know we have to keep pushing. I hope that Joe Biden he's already talked about wanting to ban assault weapons and and take some other more serious steps. Uh, I hope he exerts the kind of leadership that uh, maybe gives those uh, proposals a chance. Okay. Now, I, I, I know you have a time commitment, but do you, uh, I want to make sure I'm respectful of your time. You've got time for about two more questions? Absolutely. Great. All right. Um, again, we're going to look at the election. Uh, one of your uh, uh, colleagues, Republican Congressman Don Young of Alaska, just won his 25th term. Uh, he won his first term in 1972. There are 60 other members of Congress um, that have been in Congress since the 1970s, 80s, or 90s. Uh, this, there are over 15, there are 15 senators uh, in the U.S. Senate that have been there prior to 2000. Um, in 1994, uh, my class, we've already looked at this, uh, the 1994 midterm elections, uh, the Republican Party came with their contract with America, and one of their proposals was the term limits, but that, that didn't pass. Um, when we see, I mean, congressmen and women and senators that have had such long careers uh, to create seniority, is this something that 
Congress needs to re-examine that uh, term limits and or is it or is a long senior uh, senior seniority uh, a good thing to have? I, I've come 180 degrees on this question. My, okay. my initial thinking on it was, if people want the same person to represent them for 50 years, they ought to have that right. They ought to have the right to have anybody they want represent them. Um, but I've seen the consequences of that. And uh, I've also seen that seniority, uh, basically after a few years, you know enough about the job here to, to be a very effective member. So you don't have to spend 20 years here to, to know the ropes. So I really don't think seniority is all that helpful institutionally. And, further, and the biggest problem I see with it now is we have a world that's changing so rapidly that people who have been here for 20 years or longer, uh, they're in ruts. It's, it's just impossible to believe that they wouldn't be. And we need a constant refreshing of, of members here to keep up with the change. The people who have been in society and dealing with the change rather than sitting in a, a 240 year old institution that really doesn't change much. So um, the other thing is, so I, I'd love to see term limits unless we did one or both of two things. One is to have public financing of campaigns so that nobody has a huge financial advantage, incumbents don't have a huge financial advantage, and we, and we figure out a different way to, read, to draw district lines so that we don't create districts that are safe for one party or the other. That's okay. called uh, ger gerrymandering. We need, if, we were to, if we were to figure out a way to end gerrymandering and do public financing of campaigns, we wouldn't need term limits, but okay. the odds of our getting it are getting either one of them are pretty remote. And, but the problem is term limits require a constitutional amendment and that's almost impossible to do. So, mm. you know, we're probably stuck with that. Um, and, you know, I, I would hope voters in more cases take that into their own hands and say, Mitch McConnell, 36 years is enough. We need, we need new thinking, uh, but they didn't do that this year. So uh, the only way you foresee term limits is just simply by the American public creating a forced term limit by voting. Exactly. Yeah. Um, speaking of voting, uh, I had the, the class is predominantly all seniors. Um, some of them actually voted for the very first time. Great. Uh, and, and a number of them were just slightly too young. They're not there yet. Um, but when we did look at the election, although I'm very excited that we had uh, nearly 67% of the population turn out, it still means we have about a third of a percent that has some sense of they, they don't feel like their vote's going to matter or they didn't right, take right. the respect to vote or whatever it is, or maybe health conditions. Um, so to my classroom, uh, last question for you is this, is, is why should they take the time to vote? How should they get involved with voting? Why is it important for them to vote? Well, you know, I could spend another half hour or so talking about how government actually does directly affect people's lives. I think a lot of people don't vote because they don't think government affects them. Um, and it's kind of like when we were working on the, the Affordable Care Act, people would say, uh, just, I just want to keep the government away from my Medicare. Uh, so they didn't even think Medicare was a government program, which of course it is. Yeah. Um, and so again, people never, a lot of people don't make the connection. And, you know, like young people, I could spend a lot of time talking about the fact that many of them are going to go to college and, and they're going to get student loans. The government is making a student loan. The government's deciding how much the interest rate will be. The government is deciding under what terms you can have that loan forgiven. So the government directly impacts your lives. And, uh, and it's not just the federal government. As a matter of fact, I tell everybody, you got to vote all the way through the ballot because the people who most directly and consistently affect your life are people in the Metro Council, school board members, uh, uh, state legislators, uh, judges. Those are the people who directly affect your life on an everyday basis. We don't, uh, you know, we, we deal with more big, big picture items, at least we're supposed to. So that it's really important. And, and what I always tell people is, remember not voting is the same thing as voting for the person you don't want. Right. So if you hated Donald Trump, and you said, I'm not gonna vote, then you're actually voting for Donald Trump. Or, the, and the same thing I would say against Joe Biden. If you don't like Joe, Joe, Joe Biden's agenda um, and you stay home, you're voting for Joe Biden. Yeah. 
and, and as you point out just a moment ago, that uh, if you live on a road that has a bunch of potholes and you want it fixed, well, it's your, your city, it's our Metro Council that is going to be the one that's determining if your road is going to get fixed. Exactly right. So. Exactly right. Well, uh, Chairman Yarmouth, thank you so much for being a part of our class today. I truly do appreciate it. I know our guys appreciate it. And uh, thanks for serving our district. Great, and uh, to all the, all the students, uh, congratulations on your, your impending uh, graduation and good luck to you uh, in the future. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Congressman Yarmouth, for spending this time with us. It was truly appreciative. Guys, thanks for listening as always. And as the Congressman said, your vote matters. If you want to implement term limits, uh, since we don't have them right now, your vote creates term limits. Um, as always, fellas, understand that there's two perspectives. There is the Democrat perspective and the Republican perspective. Thanks again, fellas. And remain awesome. Be nice. Stay safe. See ya.